So why are we talking about garbage collection? Like, in particular, why are Will and I talking about garbage collection? Well, it's sort of a personal story or one of our company. So we work at a company called Pusher. You might have heard of us. I know some people in the audience use us, but for those who don't, this is roughly what our system does. It's a message bus. So we have some, how do I use the uh, pointer on here? I'll use my finger. We have our customers on the left here, and they send us messages, and eventually they come through on the right here to clients. And this is supposed to happen very quickly, so we're sort of a, a real-time company. In the middle, we cache those messages uh, in a buffer so that these clients can catch up if they drop messages or disconnect. Now, last year in tw like 2016, we decided to rewrite the core of this system, so the bit in the middle that does this caching and message passing, and we decided to use not Go, but Haskell. And things were going fairly well until we decided to performance test it, which was several months after we'd actually started writing it. And this is what we saw. It's probably not immediately obvious what this means, but it's bad news. So this is a screenshot of a program called ThreadScope, which shows you one run of a GHC Haskell program. And we've got time from left to right. And I've annotated this with these vertical pink lines, which are telling you every time that our system was sending a message. And you can see these kind of nice bunched up um, periods where we're sending lots of messages. But there are also these kind of gaps where we're not really doing anything. It's kind of white gaps. So these are bad news for our customers because it means that it's adding latency to the messages that they pay us to send very fast. So why is this happening? Well, the answer is also in this screenshot is these like orange blobs that exactly correspond with these gaps, which if you look on the left-hand side, say GC is garbage collection. So what is this garbage collection? Why is it pausing our process? And what can we do about it? Well, yes, these were the ones I'm pointing to. Well, let's answer the first question there. What actually is garbage collection? Well, roughly speaking, all programs work in exactly the same way. They can create objects on the heap, and they can move pointers around. So in Go, that looks like these two things. You can take the address of an object literal, and that allocates something in the heap. And you can take pointers and put them in fields on other objects. And in doing so, you create something that looks like this sort of graph of objects. Now, the key point here is that some of these objects, after a while, are no longer accessible by the process, like these ones that I've highlighted here. Uh, so they're kind of useless, they're dead, and if you leave things, then you'll just fill up memory, and your everything will just grind to a halt. We don't want that to happen, and so we use a garbage collector to detect these and get rid of them. How do we do that? Well, there are lots of ways to do garbage collection. I'm going to show you one way to start, which is called mark and sweep. It's kind of the simplest way to do garbage collection. It's kind of the classic algorithm. Um, and I'm also going to explain it because it's sort of the precursor to understanding how Go does garbage collection. So how does mark and sweep work? Well, going back, here is sort of pseudocode. We loop forever. and we run our program for a while, then we pause it. We then do a mark phase. We then do a sweep phase. Then we unpause our process and carry on for a while. The complex part in this is sort of the mark phase. That's where all of the kind of complexity happens. So let's kind of dig into how we actually do that mark phase. During this mark phase, what you're doing is allocating each object to one of three sort of sets, which we can call black, 
gray and white. And in this diagram, you can see we've got this black set, we've got this gray set, and we've got this white set, which is everything else. And each object is in one of those sets. The way that the mark phase proceeds is to repeatedly take something from your gray sort of boundary set here and mark it. To mark it, you take that object and you move it into your black set in the middle, and then you scan it for any sort of child objects, things that it's pointing to, and you mark those gray. So let's look at a little animation of that. So we took this object here, and we marked it. So we move it into this black set, and we mark this one gray, because it's pointing to it. And we do this repeatedly. So we did it with this one. We do it with this one at the top. And finally, we do it with this one here. And at this point, you'll notice there are no more things in our gray set. And so we are done with our mark phase. At this point, we know everything in the middle, the, your black set, that is your accessible object, and everything in the white set is inaccessible, so you can sweep it away, and so you proceed to your sweep phase. Like this. So what's wrong with mark and sweep? Well, it's got one nice thing about it, which is that it's simple. I was able to explain that in just a few slides. There are several things that you can criticize mark and sweep for. So for example, it traverses your entire heap, which can be very expensive. It doesn't do any sort of compaction, taking your objects and moving them into a nice, tight, tidy set. But the most important thing about mark and sweep, which is bad, at least for us at Pusher, is that it pauses your process. So you have this sort of procession from running your program for a while then pausing it, doing this mark phase, then this sweep phase, and then unpausing. And these mark and sweep phases can potentially take a long time. And from the explanation, you should see that it's sort of proportional to how many things that you have in your heap. So if you really have a lot of things in memory, like we did in our cache of messages, it really starts to add up. So it starts to turn into dozens of milliseconds, which for us is unacceptable. So from that discussion, it's kind of clear that there are lots of trade-offs in garbage collection. There's not really any perfect way to do it. There are lots of things that you might want from it, and you can't get them all. So you, you might want low latency. You might want high throughput. You might want simplicity. You might want it to be parallelizable, predictable. Well, let's just look at two of those. So I graphed them on here. You've got low latency, which we want. We want to send messages fast. And we also would like to have high throughput. We'd like to send lots of messages per second. But there's a sort of a trade-off there in which garbage collector you pick. What that means is this, this green line here is sort of lots of possible points of good garbage collectors and what they trade off. And on this end, we've got Haskell. This is what we initially picked, and it was a terrible choice for us because it optimizes for throughput. It's explicitly designed for throughput and sacrifices this latency metric. At the other end of this green line, we've got Go, which explicitly is optimized for low latency at the, and sacrifices a little bit of this throughput metric. There are other points in this space which I should mention. So in the bottom left, we've just got like bad garbage collectors. There are lots of examples of these. They're not so interesting. At the top right, I've said Python, but it's sort of a cheat. So I've claimed that it gives you like low latency and high throughput, but the way it does that is through reference counting, where you keep for each object a count of how many references there are to it, and when that reaches zero, you can free your object. That gives you very low latency, because it's just happening with your program, and it gives you high throughput, because it's very cheap. But it does mean that you can create cycles of objects which are not detectable, and so you do actually potentially leak memory. So it's kind of a cheat. It's not actually garbage collection. 
So concentrating on the interesting point here, the point that we want, the low latency, how does Go actually achieve that? Well, it starts with that algorithm which I explained, the classic simple mark and sweep algorithm. And it tries to take that but remove that undesirable pause. And the way that it does that is by running it concurrently with your program. So instead of having this like step phase on the top, which is classic mark and sweep, instead you sort of run your process in parallel with this mark sweep phase, which is just constantly happening under the hood. But how do we actually do that? Because at first sight, it kind of seems hard to think about how you do this marking at the same time as the process moving things around in this graph under your feet. So how does Go do that? Well, it does it with an algorithm called the tricolor algorithm. The reason it's called tricolor is it's talking about those same three sets that I talked about, the black, gray, and white sets. And essentially, tricolor is concurrent mark and sweep. How do we do that? I could tell you if this would go to the next slide. That's one answer. Is it the battery? Uh, uh, OK, this is working. All right, well, I'll just stand at the laptop then. So how does the tricolor algorithm work? Well, to answer that, we kind of have to think about why mark and sweep works. Uh, so the answer is that it has this key invariant that it maintains throughout the whole process, which is that there are no pointers from your inner black set to things in the white set across this boundary. So this red arrow pointer here is an example of something that does not happen in mark and sweep. What this means is that when you get to the end of mark and sweep, you know that everything in the middle is your accessible objects and everything outside is garbage because there can be no pointers between those two sets. What we need to do is maintain this invariant even when we're running the process at the same time. So how do we do that? Because it kind of seems like the process breaks this invariant whenever it does stuff. So here are some examples of what your process could do. It can create new objects. So here's one that it could create over here. And in doing so, it's broken this invariant because you've got this pointer across this gray boundary set. Here's another example. So instead of putting this in the white set, you could put it in the black set. And you're still kind of breaking your invariant because your new object can have pointers in it, which could point across this boundary. Also, your process can move pointers around. So here, the process could move this pointer here to instead point to this object up here. And again, it's broken this invariant. So how do we run this process and maintain this invariant? Well. The answer is sort of simple. Whenever the invariant is potentially broken, we fix it. So every possible way in which that invariant can be broken, we have a potential or a fix for that. And actually, there are only two ways in which your process can potentially break that invariant. So it can create new objects. The question is, where do you put those new objects in terms of these three sets? Well, you can kind of work it out just by process of elimination. So you could try putting it in this white set. This doesn't work because you've got a pointer from the process to this new object. You could try putting it in this black set. Again, this doesn't work because this new object can have pointers to outer white objects. So you could try putting it in the gray set. And that, it turns out, works. 
It always works. And the reason is that your invariant applies to this black inner set and this white outer set. So by putting things in this gray set, you are removing it from the possibility of breaking that invariant. So that's fix up number one. Secondly, your process can move pointers around. So what should we do when the process moves a pointer? So let's look at an example. So in this example, your process has taken this pointer here and decided to instead move it to point to this object here. What should we do in that case? Because the process has, again, broken that invariant. Well, the same principle applies. You color the object gray. So you take your pointy, the object that's pointed at, and you move it into this gray set. And in so doing, you maintain that invariant. All right, so that's, those are kind of the only two rules that you actually need to take mark and sweep and make that concurrent. I've kind of skipped over a couple of details that might be interesting. So firstly, you might wonder how Go actually detects those pointer moves. So if you have some background in C or C++, a pointer move is really just taking an address and putting that somewhere else. So what's actually detecting that? Well, the answer is that there is a so-called write barrier, which is just a bit of code that's compiled in to every possible place where your pro process can move a pointer. And what that does is this recoloring logic, moving things into the gray set. This is interesting because it's one of the examples of this trade-off that I was talking about. So Mark and Sweet does not need this write barrier. In order to make this concurrent, you do need this write barrier, and it does cause extra work, which reduces your throughput. One other thing that might be interesting, you might wonder, since you're doing these things concurrently, it is possible for an object to be marked as not garbage. So for example, this one here, but then actually become garbage during this process. So if you then take this pointer and move it here, suddenly this object, which has been marked as not garbage, is now garbage. So is this algorithm leaking objects? Well, the answer is no. It won't get collected in this cycle of your mark sweep, but it will get collected in the next rate, in the next run. So the guarantee is that every object that becomes garbage is collected within two runs of your mark sweep. All right. So in summary of that kind of introduction to the theory, what Go's garbage collector does is take that classic mark and sweep algorithm and make that concurrent in order to remove these undesirable pauses. And it does that by running it concurrently. And to do that, it maintains this key invariant of mark and sweep with this recoloring logic. And if you do that, the theory says that everything just works well. So you have your process, which is just constantly running, and you never get any pauses. It's predictable, and you can completely forget about garbage collection as a problem. That's the theory. Now I will hand over to Will, who will talk about garbage collection in practice. And we'll see if any of that is actually true. Okay, cool. Um, okay, thanks, Jim. So hopefully everyone now has an idea of um, uh, how goes uh, garbage collector runs concurrently with the process and why this allows for these um, short pause times. Um, but really, we we wanted to check that this was good enough. We had um, 
clear requirements about our worst case acceptable pause times. Um, so we wanted to create a benchmark and actually check this in practice. Um, we wanted our pause or latency to be uh, less than 50 milliseconds in all cases. And this is with a relatively large number of objects in memory, as we previously mentioned. So we wanted to create a benchmark that was kind of representative of the real world program that we were writing. And the reason we wanted to write a benchmark and not uh, just profile the actual program is because the benchmark's uh, nice and simple. It's easy to profile because if there are any problems, it's much easier to get to the bottom of the root cause of it than in a real world messy program. And essentially, the, the benchmark we created is this. So you have a process which just allocates a buffer. Um, and it just sequentially, in a loop, writes items into that buffer. When it gets to the end, it will just overwrite older items. And basically, what we're trying to do here is create a large heap. So these are all uh, pointers to objects, um, these items. And it means that for every garbage collection, it has to traverse this entire buffer in memory. Uh, and we're constantly overwriting old items. So there's always work for the garbage collector to do. Um, you can imagine for garbage collectors that stop the world, this would be a very, uh, like a worst case in terms of latency. So that's the benchmarking code. It's really simple. So you just have a loop here. Uh, you can kind of tweak these, the number of iterations, the number of, um, and the number of items in the buffer. But the kind of key thing is here, we're allocating new items. And then on the next line, we're writing them into the buffer at sequential indexes, overwriting old items. Um, we, we actually wrote up uh, our results from this uh, benchmark in Go and in Haskell. It's on our Pusher engineering blog. And following that, it's kind of been uh, adopted by the community a bit. And people have been porting it to lots of different languages. Uh, it's now in 15 languages. And I think the reason people like it is because it's so simple. It's very easy to port across languages. And you just get one number out at the end, which is the worst case uh, pause time. So it's very easy to compare results from different languages. I should also mention, you have to take these micro benchmarks with a bit of a pinch of salt. Uh, yeah, a pinch of salt, because they're, uh, they're not exactly realistic. Like, you're running at 100% CPU which is not really what would be happening in, happening in many real world programs, but it's quite a nice proxy anyway. So let's look at some of the results. I just ran this on my laptop, and I've picked a few of the interesting ones. As you can see, Go is doing actually really quite well in terms of this worst case pause time. And to be honest, like it's fine for us. We had a requirement of 50 milliseconds. This is. Uh, below 10 milliseconds, so it's really quite good. As you can see, Haskell is not performing so well. It's an order of magnitude slower uh, in the worst case. And it's actually worse than what you see here, because, because it's got a stop the world garbage collector. It means that if you double the number of items in that buffer, then you double the worst case pause time. Because Go's garbage collector runs concurrently, each collection's interleaved with the process you don't have that same like linear relationship between the two. I found, I'm not a Java expert, by the way, but I found it interesting how bad, poorly this performed, at least superficially. This is using, Java has a number of garbage collectors. This is using the G1 collector, which is the one that is recommended if you want uh, low latency. Uh, Java's collect garbage collectors are highly tunable, unlike Go. Go only has like one parameter which you can t tweak. Go, uh, Java tries to be a jack of all trades and allow you to configure it depending on what kind of requirements you have. This is kind of nice in some ways, but on the other hand, if you, you really need to understand the, the garbage collector, you have to understand some of the internals. And if you, don't, if you just go for the default, it will try and use heuristics to figure out what values to set the uh, parameters to. And this can cause a bit of a warm-up period, which is actually, I think, what you're seeing there. So it's kind of a bit of an unfair comparison. 
if you let it run for longer, you should see that come down. But it is highlighting another trade-off that's being made, which is how configurable you want your garbage collector to be. I found OCaml really interesting because it's doing so well. So I spent a little bit of time looking into the algorithm that they're using, and it turns out it's pretty much the same idea as Go. It's also using tricolor mark and sweep, um, which, may, which led me to the question, well, why is Go not performing at least as well as OCaml? Particularly because around the time, the Go team were making claims that you really shouldn't be seeing pause times above 100 microseconds, which is, well, we were seeing, we saw, just saw a pause time that was two orders, orders of magnitude greater than that. So I'm going to whip out uh, Go Tool Trace, which Alexi has, has previously shown. And you can actually uh, see this issue uh, visually. So if I just come out of here. So this is a, a visualization of that benchmark. We've got the heap here, which is a really nice representation of what the benchmark's actually doing. So initially, it's just writing new objects into this buffer. So the heap just keeps growing. And then at some point, it levels out when it starts writing items over existing items. So occasionally, you'll see periods of time where the garbage collector runs, and then it, the heap size drops off. Uh, it's just a single single Go routine that's running. So that's this kind of pinkish red uh, color here. These are the CPUs that it's running on. So let's just zoom in on one of these garbage collection uh, runs. And I really like this because you can very clearly see the two phases that Jim highlighted earlier. You've got, uh, it's kind of hard to read, but if you take my word for it, this period of time is where the mark phase is running. So it starts here and then finishes at the end of this mark termination phase. And then if we zoom in here, it's kind of hard to see, but this is where the sweep phase is running. And it's actually running in parallel with the Go routine that's uh, running the benchmark. Interestingly, the, the Go routine that's running the benchmark also has to do a little bit of sweeping, too. But this looks OK. The, the Go routine is running fine. It's not doesn't appear to be being blocked from running. But if we go back to the mark phase, you can see that the numbers are too small here. But again, take my word for it. This is a, about from this period of time here, which is 640 milliseconds into the benchmark running, to 655 milliseconds. The main Go routine is completely blocked from running. And this roughly matches up with the pause time that I showed in the chart previously. It's a little bit more because there is extra instrumentation running here. So you get that kind of 30% overhead from running that. So we, we actually um, wrote this up in the blog post that I mentioned. I wasn't entirely sure why this was happening, um, but we had a little bit of dialogue with the Go team uh, following this. And a couple of issues came out of it. The first one ha had actually previously been reported. And it's basically what you just saw there in the trace visualizer, where there's these background mark workers, which are meant to just run when there's idle time. Um, that didn't seem to be happening. There was always work to do. And the other issue was that they run for a full 10 milliseconds when they should really be yielding to the main process when more work comes in. This has now been fixed, which is really cool. Um, there was also another issue that came out of this, which is in the sweep phase, where the, so if, if the garbage collector is running and a Go routine needs to allocate new objects, and there's a very high rate of allocation, it's required to do a bit of sweeping before it's allowed to actually allocate a new object. And this, in certain cases, can uh, run for too long. I'm not going to go into any more detail on these issues. To be honest, it goes a bit over my head. I'm not an expert on the details of the internal implementations here. But I think the point of this is to, just to show really how hard it is to consistently achieve these short pause times. I think it also demonstrates how uh, much the Go team care about this. These are issues that are very actively being worked on, which are, we've found very promising, um, particularly because latency is something that we also care about. But kind of just taking a step back now, I think the key point of this presentation is that 
garbage collectors make trade-offs. Um, not all of them are optimized for, the, for the, your particular requirements. So our requirements were a low, low latency and a large working set. Uh, and it turns out Go is a good fit for that. But you might have, I don't know, you might not need a large working set, in which case you can pick a language like Haskell and it will be absolutely fine for you. Um, so really what you should be doing is be very clear about your requirements, um, then understand how your garbage collection algorithm works and the trade-offs that it's making, but then also like test that it really does work and does fit your requirements with a simple benchmark that we showed here. And with that, uh, that's about it. So thank you very much. And if you do have questions, then um, feel free to ask. Hello, thank you. I am have a question for Jim, uh, theoretical most, mostly. Um, I don't know a lot of uh, about about Golang's uh, garbage collection, uh, but I know that in theory, um, concurrent uh, garbage collection has a limitation. You should, um, at least on average, you should collect uh, garbage faster than you produce it. Otherwise, what what will happen? Otherwise, uh, yeah. It's a good question. Um, I think the answer is, so the point that you're making is if you are actually allocating objects at an extremely fast rate, then your garbage collection might not actually keep up with that. And I think that is a real problem. Um, I think the reality is that that's very rare. Um, I, I'm not aware of Go actually having any uh, kind of detection of that problem. Um, I think it's sort of an assumption that that is sufficiently rare. <laughs> um, sort of in the same spirit as uh, we saw earlier in the, in the day where you can kind of, it's theoretically possible for one Go routine to take a, all of the CPU and starve other ones and there's nothing actually to detect that. It's rare, it is possible. Um, there's, there's also a bit of what I mentioned in the sweep phase where the Go routines that are running the main process actually have to do, so if they want to allocate an object, they actually have to do some work um, in sweeping before they find enough space before they can allocate, which kind of means that you never quite get to that position where your garb garbage collection um, sort of dominates too much. Corner, car yeah. corner cases everywhere. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. true. Yeah, thank you. Can I also add to your answer? Yeah. Um, I want to add to, you, uh, to the answer is that in Go, a lot of allocation actually happens on stack. Uh, compiler uses escape analysis, so a lot of data actually being allocated on stack, and so it doesn't have to be collected. And I, I think that's the big difference, for example, with uh, Java, where pretty much everything uh, allocated and should be garbage collected. And I think because of that, it's a rare event. I, I also not aware of if anyone have, have ever um, wrote this program that actually allocates memory um, allocates object faster than garbage collector can uh, collect them. Yeah. Hi guys, thanks for the presentation. Uh, have you ever tried any techniques to reduce the load for collection, garbage collection itself, like sync pool or whatever? Are you using this uh, memory or? Um, I, I don't think we have in Go at least. Um, we, in our Haskell implementation, we did try quite hard before we just gave up on GHC, uh, various approaches to just reducing garbage collection load. Um, when we began, we actually didn't understand garbage collection very well, and so we put a lot of effort into just sort of reducing the amount of garbage with the kind of intuition that because your garbage collector works on garbage, if you reduce the amount of garbage, then it's got less work to do. That wasn't actually true because 
copying collectors like GHC work on your working set, so the amount of garbage is irrelevant. Um, we tried uh, instead moving things into uh, C and managing things with C. Uh, we had other problems with that, like serializing things. Um, there are other interesting approaches in Haskell as well, which we haven't looked into. In Go, I think we we haven't needed to put much effort into any. So basically, it performs so well, so you just need it, don't need it. Uh, I think so far that has been true. Yeah. Yeah, there are. Um, that's basically the the main reason we haven't needed to do this. There are, uh, like, you can There are libraries which provide off heap storage, um, so you just basically do your own manual me memory management on some like byte array or something like that. Um, actually. Haskell has since introduced those kind of approaches as well. Um, but I mean, you should only really use them if you have to. Like, it's more fiddly. It's just more manual work to do. So, um, but those options are available if you need them. I have one more question about your benchmark. What is execution time of this benchmark in Go and Haskell? How much Haskell is quicker than Go because of different approach in, in collecting the garbage? I don't think I've actually measured it because it wasn't really what we were looking for. Um, like the the problem is it's it's not it's hard to measure the. The, just the throughput of the garbage collector. I guess you could be measuring just the general performance of the actual language and runtime system. Um, I think they're, they're kind of comparable, to be honest. Um, but if you measure just the throughput of the garbage collector, like the CPU usage of the garbage collector, um, I'd be very interested to see that. Uh, but I guess you would have to like use the Lang runtime language instrumentation actually to get just the time that's spent doing GC. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you can download the repository and time to run those timings yourself. I haven't really tried it. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Uh, you said in your presentation that uh, garbage collection in Go has one uh, parameter, and which parameter it is, and how we could configure it. I can't remember, <laughs> to be honest. Um, Go GC, yeah, but I can't remember what the what it's tweaking. Is it the frequency of? No, it's, it, it's saying the threshold, right? The threshold of memory when you uh, you use it uh, for execution time is the threshold of memory when you execute the I think, yeah, you can actually see that. Um, so this is just using the default value. Um, the reason I don't know is if we've never really needed to change it. Um, but I think what you're saying here is that, it, so the, the light green is the, the available heap, and the dark green is the used heap. And I think what you're seeing here is the, every, t every time the heap kind of increases by double, I think that's what it's showing. Yeah, it doubles in size each time. Yeah, and the idea, and the idea is that it, like, keep it simple, as simple as possible. And then, for example, if the program runs in the future, like in 10 or 20 years, in the hardware that has, I don't know, like terabytes of RAM, you can increase this to, let's say, 1,000%. And so you get less, less um, interval between the GC, just by clicking one, one, uh, yeah. Thanks. Interesting. Yeah. Um, have you been following uh, the new experiments that the Go team uh, doing with the garbage collector? They Rick Hudson said something about new experiments uh, with. Um, idea hypothesis that most of the Go programs create garbage during the requests. So they can do some new trade-offs, some different trade-offs based on it. Have you been following it? 
I haven't, but it sounds okay. interesting. <laughs> okay. And okay, and the second question, this issue that now has been fixed, it was opened by you, by by you or it was existing before? So the first one existed before. Uh, okay. where are they? I can open the um, yeah, so th this one previously existed and I think it's that's the one that you you see in the trace. And this one uh, this one wasn't reported by us, but it was uh, came from this blog post that we wrote, um, which is kind of a lot of the content of this talk. Right. Um, so yeah, that came from this benchmark, essentially. OK, thank you. You, uh, Jim, you said that um, Python's uh, garbage collection is a, is a cheat. It's not a garbage <laughs> collection. But is it fair? Um, you know, each time, um, what is the reference counting? You, uh, each time you change pointer, you do something. In Crimean, for example, reference count. Right. But when you are, do, when you are doing, um, uh, when you change um, pointer in Golang, you have to adjust something right. too. It's, yeah. it's um, pretty, it's, uh, it's a cheat. In your words. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I consider it a cheat because, well, what I didn't, what I sort of skimmed over is that uh, Python does have a cycle collector which normally runs at the same time as your reference counting. And uh, that sort of behaves in the same way as garbage collection. Um, if you turn off that cycle collector, um, which you can do at runtime, then you do get this uh, system which can potentially leak, but if you ensure that it doesn't, gives you fairly good performance. Um, you're saying that, yeah, you are constantly performing a little bit of work with each time that you reference an object in Go and also when you reference an object in Python. I think that's true. Um, the main way in which uh, Python is kind of cheaper is that that's really the only thing that it does. Uh, it's sort of equivalent to the stuff in the memory write barrier in Go, and it doesn't have any of this other work that it needs to do. So um, actually, uh, each garbage, garbage collection is in some sense equivalent, equivalent to reference counting. And, um, or, in other words, uh, modern gar garbage collectors are mixed. They are garbage collectors and reference counters right. at the same yep. time. Uh, that's why I yes. think Python's, uh, saying that Python's garbage collection is cheating. Is well, <laughs> yes. <It's laughs> it, it works. Yeah. It's and it's good. Maybe cheat with a question mark, I should have said. It's, it's certainly like above that theoretical line, I think, <laughs> if you turn off the cycle collector because you do have the potential to leak. Hi, guys. Uh, I came from the Ruby world, and uh, we have uh, one uh, special uh, property of garbage collector in Ruby. Uh, if uh, uh, we want to release uh, memory from uh, Ruby heap to operating system back, uh, in Ruby there are uh, several uh, uh, heap pages, and uh, each page uh, have uh, a lot of uh, slots. Uh, each slot uh, uh, holds uh, one object, and if uh, this page has uh, one busy slot, we can uh, return uh, this slot back to operating system. So in Go, if uh, garbage collector will sweep uh, uh, some uh, objects, will the memory immediately uh, return back uh, to operating systems or not? Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, I don't suppose you do? Whether I don't know I for sure. I think yeah. so. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, using the standard kind of malloc free um, thing that you see in C or C++, um, but it's doing something similar to that under the hood, so actually fetching pages of memory and um, organizing them itself. So it, I think it, it, under the hood it has something similar to malloc and free, but not necessarily using those exactly. 
So one last question. Uh, guys, what was the reason why you used uh, Haskell for your first implementation? Uh, well, that goes back to before my time at the company, and I think the answer is probably just curiosity. Um, it's an interesting language to play around with, and I think that's sort of killed the project in many ways. Um, it was very nice in its kind of theoretical properties. We were very kind of confident in the program for its correctness. Um, I think the people that started this project really w were concerned about that because like, we are a company that is kind of paid for its reliability um, and we really wanted to be sure that we're not losing messages, dropping them somewhere or reordering them and we want to be sure that the system is up all the time. Um, internally, the system was using a like, custom implementation of Raft within the um, within this, which was ensuring um, that we never drop any messages because we have some redundancy. Um, I think it was just that someone decided to implement Raft in Haskell because that was because it's it's kind of a complex thing to implement. So maybe pick something where you can understand exactly what's going on, like Haskell. Um, but it, of course, it has problems as well with performance. Thank you so much. Will and Jim, Thank your you. applause. Thank you.